So uh, I have the pleasure to discuss these really these three really interesting projects, three published articles, and 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 one uh, working paper. And um, since most of the work is published, my role isn't so much to to give comments in into the the publication, but to think about a bit about some of the broader implications, um, maybe some 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 linkages with policy, and and then some possible points for discussion. Um, so as I think Dan has summarized well in the the opening remarks, and the the presenters also have have uh, have summarized well that these three papers these three projects offer really interesting insights on, on state capacity. Um, and uh, I just highlight a few more implications for the literature on state capacity. Um, I think Matthias's work, and Matthias and colleagues' work, uh, really does a great job of spotlighting the importance, let me stand, of informational capacity and in particular um, not only distinguishing informational capacity but showing how informational capacity can be sort of a precursor to fiscal capacity. This has a number of really interesting implications for the literature but one that that's jumped out to me was implications for, for measurement of state capacity. And many of you will know there are a, a number of measures of state capacity and of related concepts uh, like governance um, and these measures are used for a variety of, of research purposes and, and also for more applied work. Um, in recent work, for instance, I've looked at, at how these measures can help us to think about pandemic response um, and sort of future resilience to crises. So there are a number of these measures. They're used a lot, but I think for the most part, with the exceptions of the, the several indicators that Matthias and colleagues talk about, there hasn't been a huge amount of attention in the work to statistical capacity or informational capacity as, as they term it. Um, so it could be interesting to, to think more about that in some of this measurement work. I have some sort of a soft spot here for this because <coughs> Many years ago, I worked on an, uh, a measure of governance called the Ibrahim Index of African Governance. Um, and we spent quite a bit of time playing around with the possibility of including a measure of statistical capacity in the index um, because there was so much missing data on these sort of basic things that we would expect uh, states and, and, uh, and uh, states to have collected information on. And I think if I had, if Matthias's paper had been around then, I would have pushed a bit harder for including this, this sort of indicator of statistical capacity in the, the index. I think Oliver and, and colleagues' work asks a really um, a broader and, and really ambitious question. Uh, in the article, they seek to identify the institutional variables that influence the evolution of state capacity, uh, especially with reference to Sub-Saharan Africa. And they find, um, not surprisingly, but I think importantly, that effective governance seems to be important here. So there's a link in particular between equal distribution of resources, which is positively associated with their measure of, state, of tax capacity, um, and then corruption is negatively associated with tax capacity. So I think this is really important to show empirically. Um, and then in the new paper, they, they look at the other side of, of the relationship. So they find this relationship between tax and improved vertical accountability in terms of, measured in terms of the quality of elections and, and party competition. So it really provides some empirical background to a lot of the discussion around fiscal bargain and social contracts and, and tax. I guess one question for, for Oliver and colleagues is, is why, if they could, tease out a bit more what the mechanisms might be and why they don't, why they think they're not finding a relationship between tax and, and other measures of accountability. So in terms of, for instance, participation by a civil society or uh, judicial, the, the various judiciary measures that they look at and sort of what other measures of accountability they've looked at and can you use those to tease out what this relationship is a bit more. Um, and then Leander and, and James, they present a really provocative argument that standard measures of state capacity focused on tax revenue as a share of national income are insufficient. In particular, they, they fail to explain 
the, the Rwandan state, which has had low tax capacity, but, but clearly high capacity to do other things. And I think this is a, a very important point, especially as uh, so much of the research literature has used tax revenue as a share of national income as a, as a proxy for, for state capacity. But then this leads to sort of a, a second set of comments. Um, I think it would be interesting to reflect a bit, uh, perhaps especially with, with Leander's paper, but maybe also with some of the others on, on the relationship between uh, their argu these arguments and broader discussions about the state um, and different dimensions of, of state effectiveness and, and state strength. So I was struck in Leander and James's paper with the argument that uh, Rwandan capacity isn't captured by conventional Weberian concepts and that they have this sort of new approach to the state measured in terms of social networks. And I suppose I was struck with what seemed to me to be a lot of overlap with some existing concepts of the state. So they mentioned in the introduction to the paper um, man's uh, concept of infrastructural power of the state, uh, which, is, which sounded a lot to me like what they're talking about as, as state capacity or as networked state capacity as, as they, they discuss it. So man defines uh, infrastructural capacity uh, as the capacity of the state, or sorry, infrastructural power as the capacity of the state to penetrate um, and centrally coordinate the activities of civil society through their own infrastructure. This sounds a lot to me like what they've, they've presented in the paper. So I'd be interested to hear why it's not and you know, what's different. Um, I also saw some overlap between <coughs> discussion in the literature on the state on this distinction between um, state authority and capacity and legitimacy, which we see in a lot of work, including in some of my own. So um, in this, uh, you know, if we, th we distinguish these three things, state authority would be the ability of the state to provide order and security within its, its boundaries, state capacity to sort of get things done, um, and then state legitimacy to have the consent of the population to, to govern, and sort of the voluntary compliance of the, the population with rules and state actions. So if we use this sort of distinguishing of, of three dimensions of the state, it sounds a lot to me, I think we could tell a different story about the evidence that's presented in the article. So it sounds a lot to me like what they're showing is that historical state authority helps to explain contemporary state authority and contemporary rule compliance. So this is sort of, I think the, the data and the, 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 the argument is really interesting, but I would tell a slightly different I would frame it slightly different and I, differently, and I wonder uh, what Leander would, would say about this interpretation of the, the results. Um, let's see. I suppose broadly on, on this, I would also then ask Oliver, um, I was struck that in the, the first, the opening um, uh, presentation of the new paper, um, that he uh, sort of framed it in terms of um, providing evidence on a relationship between two indicators of state capacity, tax capacity and accountability. And I suppose I would frame it, if we're thinking in terms of accountab accountability, capacity and legitimacy, I would think about the paper as making contribution more in terms of showing the relationship between fiscal capacity or state capacity and, and state legitimacy. And then, I want to state a time. Then the, the third set of points. Um, I think there's some really interesting implications here for aid and development cooperation and for discussions around uh, aid and development cooperation. Uh, with uh, Matthias and colleagues' paper, uh, I, I was really struck that this is a really, it, it sort of, it offers really nice support for um, development partners, uh, attention to statistical capacity development, that this is a really important thing, not only because it's important to, to strengthen statistical capacity, but also because support for statistical, statistical capacity might have sort of knock-on effects on other aspects of capacity, in particular fiscal capacity. So I wonder um, 
uh, Matthias, if, if the research offers any insight here, are there sort of entry points where external actors could facilitate uh, statistical capacity or informational capacity? Or is this, you know, based on your work, is it much more of an endogenous process that's hard to influence uh, externally? Um, and then relatedly, what are the sort of timescales that you might be expecting uh, in the development of, of informational capacity and in the relationship between informational capacity and fiscal capacity? Um, what, how might we expect this, this to evolve and, and how long would we expect to wait for this to evolve? Um, for Oliver and uh, Abram's work, um, I think uh, in relation to the discussion on, on development cooperation, you know, there's been a lot of, of discussion about, uh, or I've done a lot of work on uh, thinking about aid and governance and, and support for good governance reforms and so on. And I think one really interesting implication that comes from the, the working paper is that maybe a nice way to, uh, to support accountability and to sort of speak to uh, ongoing trends in, in democratic backsliding is maybe uh, paying more attention to fiscal capacity could be one way to do this. Um, and I would be interested in, in thoughts on that based on the work. Um, I was also struck with, with Oliver's uh, and Abram's work on the sort of uh, strange parallels between their argument and the, the discussion about the aid institutions paradox in, in work by, by Todd Moss and Deborah Brodigam and Stephen Nock and, and others. <coughs> so this work makes the argument that states that raise substantial um, uh, revenues uh, that get a lot of money from donors become less accountable to their citizens. So they're more accountable to donors and less accountable to citizens. And this is kind of the, the converse of, of what seems to be happening with, with taxes. And uh, it was nice that you talked a bit, Oliver, in the presentation about the results on aid, but I wonder if there's anything more there um, about this interplay between aid and tax, and it might be interesting to pull out uh, a bit more. So let me stop there. I think I'm almost at 12 minutes. Uh, why don't we just collect a few questions from the audience now, and then I will give a couple of minutes, so three, to each of the panelists. You, sir, first, then Tony. Please keep your questions or comments very short. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, OK, just keep on talking, yes. Thanks a lot. Uh, fascinating papers. Also, the comments from Rachel, I think, were a lot of food for thought. I will limit myself uh, to, um, uh, to the paper that Matthias presented. And um, about actually, it's about how you approach uh, the issue and how you, uh, what, how you operationalize the concept. So you say that fiscal capacity is the ability of states to mobilize revenues. Now, I will ask the question that um, Oliver will, would ask to you. When you measure fiscal capacity only using tax-to-GDP ratio, do you really measure fiscal capacity? So mm -hmm. is this the dependent variable? Should you rather talk about the impact of uh, information capacity on tax collection? Wouldn't it that be more transparent? And when you talk about information capacity, doesn't the, the paper that Oliver presented to you um, speak also to that? In that regard, when, I mean, the underlying theory is that um, information on the preferences of citizens improves um, the capacity of the state to raise revenue and also to provide public services. A, huge, a very important source of information is elections. So shouldn't you factor in elections and, in this sense, vertical accountability uh, in, into your into your model. Thank you. Uh, next question from Tony. Oh, thank you. Um, so this is a, a question for Oliver, but also a suggestion. I, I assume that the shock that you refer to is a, a terms of trade shock, Oliver. Or and exchange rate. Shock. And, and a, right, the classic terms of trade shock or exchange rate shock. But there's another type of shock, which is a debt shock, and this would be worth exploring probably in another paper, but because this relates to accountability, that with, with the kinds of debt shocks that we see, basically to repay your debt, you have to allocate more revenue 
and decrease public spending on the good things that citizens and voters want. So that I suspect the accountability issue is different around a debt shock to a classic terms of trade shock. And this is, you know, has great contemporary relevance because Zambia, Sri Lanka, a number of other countries are, are basically in a debt shock. So having built a fiscal capacity of the state, including a, an ability to mobilize revenue, that's actually now <laughs> simply going to pay, repay creditors and citizens are, are somewhat annoyed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any more questions. Oh, one last one. It has to be very brief. Hi, thank you for a very interesting uh, panel. My name is Peter Eddingstein with NORAD, um, and we work on uh, the section for transparency and governance. And we actually, um, you, you mentioned policy implications, and, and we try to support a sort of whole of government approach where we do support uh, statistical uh, services and, and revenue services. and. Uh, yeah, so, so this is very interesting. Um, I just had uh, two questions. Uh, first to uh, Oliver. Uh, it's, it's interesting to see that uh, the indirect taxes uh, on accountability uh, are as strong or stronger than direct taxes. Uh, my question is, knowing that the tax base for direct taxes uh, is so much more limited in a lot of African countries, are you, when you're looking at uh, what sort of population you're actually talking about. Is it actually that the direct taxes is, is such a, a smaller part of the population uh, that is involved in an election than the indirect taxes, which is a much broader part of the population? Um, and to Matthias, um, I think this uh, legibility uh, is extremely interesting, and it's also interesting that it's coming from James Scott, it's actually a very cautionary tale about large transformative uh, sort of uh, efforts uh, to, to make uh, societies and ecosystems more legible for states. So before we sort of go into this sort of, oh, let's make everything more legible for states, uh, it would be interesting to hear you reflect a little bit about some, some cautionary uh, tales also there. Thank you. We have so many great questions and we have like six minutes. Uh, but uh, I, Leander, I want to give the floor to you first. Uh, could you respond to the questions, uh, particularly those that Rachel uh, raised uh, in like two minutes? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Rachel, for those points. And very well taken. Yes, there's been a little bit of, a, you know, how to put it, like a exponential growth in various capacities and words we use for aspects of the state. And that's, of course, just, you know, a symptom of the fact that we haven't properly defined what we're after. Right? Like in organizational economics, there's a lot of work on what makes an organization effective. And they don't really bother with words like capacity at all, it's just that the organization is effective if it makes money. Now, for the government, that's much more difficult because the governments are different types of organizations. And so we tend to have a word for each domain that a government is effective in. Right? So the states try to influence the people that, they're, that they nominally govern. So, you know, we can call that infrastructural power. Uh, they raise money, so we call this fiscal capacity. What we were trying to get at was something slightly different, which is in all these concepts and all these terms, the focal actor is sort of the Weberian state, which is people in suits sitting in the capital, getting a wage subject to laws and regulations. Now, what we're trying to get at is that that definition is too narrow for basically every part of the world historically and some parts of the world today. So the, basically the boundaries between where do the people in suits and um, the state stop are non congruent So the state is much wider than the people that the state employs. And the power that the state has is much broader than would be implied by taxes raised. So it's still the case that whichever definition of the state you use, it has all these capacities and powers and whatnot. But the point we're trying to make is that on the books, state capacity may not always necessarily reflect real state capacity in a way that correlates with outcomes such that it makes social scientists care. 
Thanks, Leander. Uh, we, if we had more time, I would have asked you about leadership and Kagame, like, you know, to the extent to which that actually um, also affects. But we'll have to do this later on. I want to give the uh, floor to Matthias. Thank you all for these, these great questions and, and Rachel for your comments. I mean, you're, you're, um, with respect to making this research actionable, I mean, I would say, uh, I would answer with a qualified yes. I mean, <laughs> what, what our findings support is, yes, yeah, aid or co development cooperation around um, yeah, creating statistical capacity, a statistics office, um, yeah, a comprehensive regular population censuses, cadaster registry and so on. Yes, I mean, this, these are avenues that are expected to have knock-on effects. But I qualify this because our historical case studies show that especially um, information gathering of um, land holdings and, and wealth needs elite compliance. And so there you come to the limit limitations of this kind of quick fix. Okay, so let's just sponsor the training of yeah, um, officials in, in conducting a population censuses and then everything will will go well. Yeah. Yes, but there's also the issue of how do you get elite compliances, especially with um, revealing or making available information on their land holding. Second, Oliver, your question is, is well taken around, um, yeah, maybe I should, yeah, sort of a more tax collection rather than tax capacity, but then the role of elections. I think this speaks to the broader issue of the drivers of information capacity. I mean, we take, we take it as an explanatory variable in this paper, but I think this is an open avenue for future research. Like, do we need to think about yeah, the, the drivers of information capacity in a different way, or can we just apply um, mainstream theories of state formation and elections being part of that? I think this is an open question. Excellent, and thank you. Oliver? Thanks for all the questions and comments. I'll try and be quick. Tony, really interesting point. I think in terms of how it might affect taxation, tax revenue, we partly account for it in the way in which we measure the exchange rate shock. Because it could, some of the debt, because we include reserves and what's happening to reserves, so it could pick up that. But I think if somebody wanted a project to look at what you're really talking about, then you really want to focus on public spending, not tax revenue. That would be the interesting thing. That would be more challenging. Um, and I think the most fruitful way of that might be country case studies, that you try to look at what's happening to um, distribute. Well, you kind of pick it up, maybe, because we do have the equity of distribution of resources. So if that's changing, that would, should pick it up. So it's worth thinking about. It might, it might be kind of hidden in there to some extent. But I think if you really want to look at it, you might want to be looking more or incorporating public spending, uh, the allocation of public expenditure. Um, on Rachel's point, aid and donors, yeah, I think they should pay more attention to fiscal and statistical and informational capacity. But to be fair to them, they do. You know, NARA does, you support, that's why we're here. <laughs> uh, you support a lot of fiscal capacity. You're not the only donor that does that. The World Bank has, does an awful lot on the survey capacity. Um, and incorporating those things might be interesting, but you couldn't do your long-term analysis with that. Um, IMF pro provides a lot of technical support. So I think donors do do it. And, but I, I would agree in the sense that as their budgets, as they reduce their budgets, maybe that's the one area they shouldn't reduce. Um, keep funding surveys and statistical and fiscal capacity and informational capacity. On your bigger question, and partly incorporating Peter's question, um, what are the underlying mechanism and why isn't it the other um, factors? Well, one part of my answer is that I think electoral accountability is the most relevant for what we're looking at. I fully appreciate the difficulties in kind of applying a median voter, median taxpayer voter literature developed and tested for developed countries um, or 
democracies, and we're beginning to wonder a lot about <laughs> these so-called praised democracies in developed countries and how good they are. Um, but in, in applying that to an African context, but, but it's still, conceptually, it's the underlying thing that matters. Because what, what we're trying to capture is, look, if, if voters feel that the tax they're paying is increasing, then we expect them to, to exert more pressure on the government to be accountable. And the, the way to do that is to try and, uh, the, the, the protest, the vote, the way they can put that pressure is at least partly through the electoral process and through, if not voting, and particularly opposition parties and all of that. So, and there have been improvements in, in vertical accountability, so it is improving. The other measures of accountability, they don't have that same link. Judicial, in particular, doesn't. It doesn't have the same link to um, voter taxpayers looking for responsiveness. Um, the, the horizontal that looks at kind of relationships between levels of government doesn't really. The civil society one, yes, we don't find an effect there, but I think it's partly because that particular accountability measure has very little variance over time. Um, whereas, you know, when we do look at determinants of vertical accountability, yeah, the neopatrimonialists and the media are very important. So, yeah, that's what's a good sign about it for us. The work isn't over. <laughs> My final point on the aid one is, because I have to say this at wider, every, every time I do work looking at effects of aid on African countries, whether it's governance or, or whatever, growth or whatever, it's not necessarily what I'm looking for, but I always seem to find a positive effect. Um, and that's something I share in common with Finn Torp. He always <laughs> seems to find a positive effect as well. Thank you very much. So we've uh, run out of time. Um, we have uh, municipal and district level elections in Norway um, on Monday. And one of the big issues in Oslo is the opposition party, the biggest opposition party saying they're going to scrap property taxes in Oslo. So this is a huge issue. The second thing, you know, it was really nice to hear were, um, Jim Scott's name being mentioned. He's my mentor. He's just gone through a severe illness. He's recovering, so we hope uh, that he recovers very quickly. Thank you, Leander, for staying up. Um, or maybe you should go to bed now. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for your participation, Matthias, Oliver, and Rachel, and to all of you. Thank you very much.